Well, thank you very much for that. Welcome, everybody. It really is uh, great to be with you uh, today. Uh, great to see you, anybody uh, watching online or at Cafe Church or in London. Big welcome to you. I hope you are all well, and I hope you've been enjoying our sermon series, The Beauty of a Transformed Life, uh, where we've been looking at what we believe are uh, four essential areas of the transform, transformed life, uh, knowing God, living in freedom, growing in community. And today, uh, as we've been doing throughout, looking through the life of Peter, we are going to start looking at what it means to make a difference. So making a difference. This is a particularly pertinent one for me. Um, I've shared uh, this with you before, but one of the things that really uh, haunted me, really, before I became a Christian, was just this sense of meaningless about life, the sense that there was just no purpose to it all, uh, the sense that it didn't really matter what I did, that it didn't make much of a difference, and in my darker moments, really, would it make any difference if I wasn't even there? And then I became a Christian, and I was forgiven of my sins, found new life in Christ, and I found a new purpose. I found that actually there was a job for me to be getting on with. There were good works for me that God had prepared for me to do. That is, I could make a difference. This was a great revelation to me. And I remember being inspired, particularly in the early days, reading about and hearing about um, various, uh, if you like, significant difference makers in church history. So standout figures like Martin Luther in the 16th century, standing up against the corruption of the church in that day and sparking the flames of the Reformation that we still live in the good of today. Or reading about John Wesley and George Whitfield, who's uh, preaching, turn this country around from a state of spiritual, moral, and in lots of cases, financial, poverty, turn this country around for God. Or someone like Jackie Pullinger, who was a young woman, got a, a one-way ticket to Hong Kong, uh, where she set up her ministry in the walled city, uh, which played host to some of the most violent gang members and far-gone drug addicts. And she was able to see some of those most violent, most hopeful cases of their lives transformed for God under her ministry. And I remember being so inspired by this. But at the same time, I do sometimes remember being quite frustrated by this because I'd hear about all these wonderful things these people were doing and then Monday morning would come round again and there I was as an accountant, okay, sat in my office job and thinking, okay, when do I get to do all this stuff? How does this work? And so on. I remember one of my great preaching heroes, C.H. Spurgeon, hearing that he preached 600 times before he was 20. I didn't become a Christian until I was 25. What am I meant to do with that? You know, or John Wesley did quarter of a million miles on horseback preaching the gospel. I can't ride a horse. What am I meant to do? (laughs) But those frustrations disappeared when I realized something, that actually God can make a difference through us. We can make a difference wherever God has placed us, whoever we are, with whatever gifts he's given us. And I realized I could look at those great saints. I could look at someone like uh, Jackie Pullinger, and I could look at what she did in her mission field of the walled city, and I could apply it in my accounting department, or now at De Montfort University, or wherever it is on my front line. And it's the same for every single one of us. Every single one of us can make a difference. So I hope this will not be a frustrating message, but will rather be an encouraging message that every one of us has the potential to make a difference. In fact, I can go one better than that. I think every one of us is probably making more of a difference right now than we even know. I remember years ago, I was on a course here at Kingsgate, and I was sat on a table with Brian Rigg. Many of you will know the Rigg family, great family here at Kingsgate, been at Kingsgate for about 25 years. And I remember uh, Brian telling this story that one day he was at work and there was a a colleague of his, he was leaving, was having a leaving do at a a place in town and Brian couldn't make it. So just out of politeness, he decided he'd send an email and in the email he just said, sorry, I'm not going to be able to make it to your leaving do, but you know, great working with you. Hadn't been working that closely with him, but said great working with you and all the best for the future. And he got a surprising reply. And I chased Brian up on this because I knew I was doing this sermon. He's actually sent me the email. And the reply came back and basically said something along these lines, said, oh, thank you very much, Brian. I'd just like to say, you probably won't know this, but while we were working together, I noticed something in you, a certain peace about you, a certain quality about you. He said later on he recognized it as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I saw that. I liked what I saw. He said, I saw something in your eyes and I thought, I'll have a bit of that. <laughs> he looked into it and he became a Christian. And Brian wrote back to him and said, you know, you've really put a smile on my face today. It's encouraging, isn't it, when we hear that? But you know what really struck me about that is what Brian said afterwards. He said, 
But if I'd never sent the email, <laughs> I'd never have known. And I wonder how many of us are in that position, if you like. We've never sent the email. We've never tapped people up. And I'm not suggesting we do, okay? But what I do want is, is to accept by faith that if God is on the inside of you, if the fruit of the Spirit is there, then people will see it. So this is a message to encourage you not to start making a difference, but to continue making a difference and to make a greater difference. And whatever your front line is, whether that be your workplace, whether that be volunteering, whatever you're doing with your uh, retired years, or maybe as it is for me, my workplace and my parenting, or maybe it's your place of education, what we want to do is what I was suggesting before. Look at a great saint from the past and apply what they did and see if we can apply it in our own front line, on our own front line, and see what we can do to make a difference. And we're going to do that with the Apostle Peter. We're going to look at an incident in his life, and not an incident of the Apostle Peter as Peter the Great Apostle or Peter the Great Evangelist or Peter the Great Leader in the early church. This incident takes place on Peter's front line. Peter as a fisherman. And we're going to see what we can pick up from this. So please watch this. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and told the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So there we see Peter on his front line. And again, we're going to look at Peter, the great difference maker in church history, significant leader in the early church. And we're going to draw out what we can from this experience. I should have said, as this incident takes place early in Jesus' ministry, this is before Jesus has renamed him Peter. So when we heard about Simon then, we're talking about Simon Peter. I'm going to refer to him as Peter throughout. I hope that made sense to you watching it there, because we're not playing the clip again. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at the life of Simon Peter in this particular incident and see what we can see, what we can can draw out to help us continue to make a difference and make a greater uh, difference uh, for our surroundings and for the kingdom of God. And the first thing we can pick up from this is this. Um, do what you do for Jesus. Can you say that for me, please? Do what you do. I love this passage of scripture and partly it's because of the setting. I just love anything to do with Lake Gennesaret, or as we perhaps know it more commonly, the Sea of Galilee, often how it's referred to throughout Scripture. Um, part of the reason I like the setting here is because I've been there. I went to Israel uh, a few years back, and the sort of second half of the holiday where we were there, we were actually up in the north. We were pretty much on a, in a hotel, pretty much on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And it's a beautiful place, and we enjoyed very much swimming in the Sea of Galilee. We went on a boat, we threw our nets one side and caught nothing, threw them the other side and caught nothing nothing. Um, we also tried to walk on water and that didn't work. But nevertheless, it was a wonderful time. It was a beautiful place. And as it's beautiful now, so it was in the first century. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus described the Sea of Galilee as the ambition of nature. That is, when nature was growing up, it wasn't dreaming of being a footballer or a movie star. It was dreaming of being the Sea of Galilee. So beautiful was it. I think that's a lovely description there. And here we can imagine Jesus. There would have been thousands of people around him on this huge body of water. It's 12 miles by 7 miles, and it's surrounded by uh, lovely big green hills. 
And these thousands of people were, would have been all down the banks of the hills and all along the shore. And it says they're actually pressing up against him. So what does Jesus do? He grabs a boat and he pushes a little bit out from shore and he basically creates his own pulpit. He sits down as was the custom in the day when somebody was speaking and the water, sound travels very well over water so it would have created a nice amplification and the the banks of the hills would have basically created a nice little amphitheater for him. I'd love to have been there just to watch Jesus himself, the master, give this sermon. And what did he say in this sermon? Well, the truth is, we don't know. Uh, The lesson in this passage of scripture doesn't come from when Jesus is speaking. It comes from when he's finished speaking, as we read this in verse four. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, again, that is Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So Simon Simon Peter is obedient to Jesus' command here. He does what Jesus says. And I think this is particularly significant. Because actually, if we look at this purely from the human vantage point, there is no way that Jesus should be the authority in this particular area. Simon Peter should be the authority. After all, Peter has the authority of position. I don't know if you noticed, but in verse 10, it said that James and John were his partners. That meant this was his fishing business. He wasn't just a fisherman. He was the boss of the business. They ran it together. So he had the authority of position. He was the boss. If you were writing about him, you'd have used that same word in the Greek that's translated master here. That's what you would have called Peter. He had the authority of expertise. He's a fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter turned preacher. He would have known very obvious things like in that part of the world, if you're fishing, you fish during the night time because that's when the fish come up to the surface of the water. You don't do it in the baking heat of the day, which is when this story occurs. So the authority of position, the authority of expertise, and he had the authority of experience. He'd actually been out that very night on the Sea of Galilee and caught nothing. And yet in spite of all that, He still calls Jesus master and he still says, because you say so, and lets down the nets. In other words, he recognizes Jesus' authority. And I think there's something profound here, something that we have to get our heads around. If we are going to be, like Peter, a difference maker in the kingdom of God, we have to recognize that Jesus is an authority above all authorities. As we often sing, he's the name above all names. Any other authority of any kind is always delegated. And therefore, whatever we do, we need to do it for Jesus. Recognize that he's who we're ultimately doing things for. So what does it mean if we're going to do what we do for Jesus? Well, ultimately, I think we can view it quite simply as it means two things. This is what it will look like. One, it means whatever we do, we do with industry. That is, we work hard. And secondly, we do with integrity. That is, we work honestly. So the first thing, if we're going to do what we do for Jesus and make a difference in the kingdom, whatever we do, we're going to do it with great industry. We're going to work hard at it. Um, Again, I think Peter is touching on a truth that comes right through scripture here. And I think it's summed up in Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And as Peter is doing this for the Lord, he's doing it for Jesus, it motivates him to do something I'm pretty sure he didn't really want to do. He'd already worked hard all night and caught nothing. I don't think he wanted to let down the nets. And yet it motivates him to do it. I'm not sure he was pleased about it, but I have to say that I have found in any situation where I'm doing something, perhaps it's a job I'm not particularly looking forward to do or some task I've got to do, whatever it is, and I don't really want to do it, If I get it right in my head and think, yeah, but I'm I'm not doing this for me. I'm not doing this just for a human boss. And no disrespect to them, but ultimately I'm doing it for Jesus. I found it's not just a motivation to do it. It's a joyful motivation. And I'm not alone in this. I remember years back, um, some of you will know my friend Joel Price. I remember him talking about a time when he worked for a cinema. Pretty cool job. You know, every now and again, just get to watch free movies and so on. But there were also some fairly not so nice parts of the job. And one of them, which was a job that nobody would volunteer for, was cleaning the cinema floor. So you can perhaps imagine if you ever have that experience when you get out of your cinema seat at the end of the film and you're, kind of, you're still stuck to the floor because of all the uh, fizzy drinks and sweets and popcorn that have been spilt everywhere. So nobody ever volunteered for this. They had to be volunteered for this. But Joel got a glimpse of this truth. He got a grip of it. And he decided that he would volunteer when it came up. And while he was cleaning the cinema floor, he used to say to himself, I'm going to clean this floor to the glory of God. 
That's getting a handle of this. It's doing what we do for Jesus. Moving away from the workplace. If I think about my front line, it's not just where I work, but for me, a lot of it is about parenting these days. And I have to ask myself the question and challenge myself sometimes. Am I, when I've got what we call daddy's son's days, where I'm looking after the boys, am I putting all my heart into that? Now, don't get me wrong. I think there are times where, as a parent, you literally have to just stick them in front of Paw Patrol or Peppa Pig or whatever it might be and just sort of get your head back together, etc. Okay, praise God for Paw Patrol and Peppa Pig, I say. But to be honest, sometimes that can just be pure laziness. I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm not really parenting for them or for the Lord. I'm parenting for me. And I'm not really going to make a difference that way. Sometimes I've just got to make sure I'm there when I'm there. Do you know what I mean? You know how you can be there but not be there? Sometimes you've just got to say to yourself, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give it all my heart. I'm going to work at this. I'm going to be the best dad that I can be because I'm doing this for the Lord. And that's what he'd want me to be. Um, just recently with Jack, very recently, in fact the last few days, um, I've introduced my uh, eldest son, Jack, who's three, to The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Um, not to the movie that came out a few years ago, but to the uh, 1980s BBC adaptation that was beloved of my childhood and we used to watch around Christmas. Um, my wife Becky was a little bit... Um, reticent to let him watch this because she was a bit worried that he might be as a three-year-old scared of the white witch and the, the wolves and things like that so uh, so we compromised we waited till she'd gone out and then we watched it <laughs> <clears throat> he was absolutely fine he just hid behind the sofa on various bits and all this kind of stuff it was quite funny though, yesterday we were watching it, and if you don't know the story, Aslan is a, a, a fantastic picture of Jesus. And there's a point when Aslan the lion is actually killed and he's died, and of course he, like Jesus, comes back to life. But Becky didn't want him to be scared, so when he was saying, what's happened to Aslan? She was saying, he's just hurt a little bit, he'll be all right. And I, and I was thinking, I don't want to mess with his theology then, so I was going, no Jack, he's definitely dead. <clears throat> But then yesterday, having kind of taken this in for the last few days, we went out in the garden to play and give uh, mum a bit of a break. We went out in the garden to play, me, Jack, and the little one, Isaac. And when we got out there, he wanted to play Narnia. So we did. And we were going out and playing and pretending the gate was the wardrobe and all this kind of stuff. And he wanted to be Asli. He loves Aslan now, which is great for me and so on. Uh, Paw Patrol figures turned up every night, which is a little bit incongruent, but there we go. <laughs> Actually, as I left this morning, we put up the Christmas decorations as well yesterday. And as we left, uh, Rubble from Paw Patrol was saving the baby Jesus for some reason. So <laughs> there are a few kinks in his theology I will have to iron out as the years go by. You know. But as we first went out to go and play Narnia, I thought to myself, oh, I haven't got my phone. And then I thought to myself, you know, I'm preparing this stuff, I'm preaching all that stuff. I think, I don't need my phone. Why do I need to go out there and be distracted by something? Why do I need to go out there and be checking football updates? And I'll be honest with you, football updates have not been happy reading for me for the last few months and so on anyway. Why do I need to do any of that? I'm just going to go out and I'm going to play with them and I'm going to give it all my heart. And do you know, that is going to make a difference for them. And not only that, it made a difference for me. It was far more fun doing that than it was looking at, I mean, they weren't playing yesterday, but Man United results over the last few weeks and stuff like that. So just about giving it our all, working at it with all of our effort and all of our heart. The second thing it will look like if we do what we do for Jesus, we will do what we do with integrity. We'll do what we do with integrity. I don't know if you've noticed this, but whatever your boss is like, that can affect how you work. Well, we have a boss of Jesus Christ himself. If you're doing it for him, most holy, righteous character, we've got to work with integrity. Back to the workplace as, a, as an example of this. Uh, many of you will know Bob and Kathleen uh, Woolley, wonderful couple here at Kingsgate. Remember Bob telling me a story when they were hosting our life group years back uh, about um, uh, his days when he was working as uh, a salesman. Bob sold these big industrial, oven, industrial ovens, huge pieces of kit, exchanged hands for huge amounts of, of money, and Bob sold these all over the world. And he had a 37-year career for the same company doing this. And when he retired, there was a little blurb went out in the trade press just to say, you know, Bob Woolley is retiring, etc. And no sooner had that gone out, that he started to get phone calls asking him to come and do some consultancy work for some of the companies that he'd sold these ovens to over the years. And one of those in particular uh, was in Ireland. And so Bob went over to Ireland and he had the first meeting as a consultant for this company. And they sat him down and they said to him, Bob, we've got you here for three reasons. Number one, we know you. Number two, we know you know the industry inside out. And number three, I don't know if you know this, 
But over the years, we've tried to get information out of you. We've tried and tried and tried to get you to spill the beans on some of the things that are going on with our competitors that we know you'd have known because you're selling to them as well. And you never once let anything slip. In other words, they were saying, we trust you. We can trust your integrity. And if you know Bob, it'll just be his godly character. Because he's filled with the Spirit, because of that, he's integrous, he's trustworthy. And what happened? It was noticed by people. And it made a difference, certainly made a difference for Bob. He told me that actually he earned three times as much a year than he did on his salary job <laughs> with by doing the consultancy stuff. And if you know Bob and Kathleen, much of that will have gone back into the kingdom. So whatever it is we do, if we do it for Jesus, it'll mean we do it with great industry, with all of our heart, and we'll do it with integrity. Wherever our front line is, whether it's work, whether it's parent groups, whether it's studying, whether it's what we're doing with our retired years, let's do what we do for Jesus. And the second thing is this. Let's do what we do with Jesus. Again, can you say that for me, please? Now, what do I mean by this? Do what you do with Jesus. Well, two things. And the first one is this. Do what you do with Jesus' help. Do what you do with Jesus' help. You see, we can put it quite starkly as a contrast here. When Peter goes out all night fishing without Jesus' help, he catches nothing. But when he follows Jesus' instructions, when he does this with Jesus, with Jesus' help, he catches so much fish that the boat is nearly sinking and the nets are nearly breaking. In other words, he has a very productive day and it's all because he called upon Jesus' help. But I think there's something particularly instructive here in Peter's attitude when he obeys Jesus. I've commended him for being obedient to Jesus, but I think if we're going to be balanced, it's only fair to pick out that there's something perhaps not quite right in his attitude when he obeys Jesus. It says, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And as one commentator put it, I think we can guess his attitude here. He's sort of saying, you know, we've been out all night and done this, but oh, because you say so, we'll do it. As if he's sort of saying, look, we're the fishermen. We know about this stuff. You're a preacher. Okay, leave us to it. Again, he does it, which is good. Half-hearted obedience is better than disobedience. But nevertheless, I think there's something off in his attitude here. And what strikes me is, I don't think he'd have been like that for a single solitary second if Jesus was giving him advice about how to preach a sermon or how to lead the prayer meeting in the synagogue or whatever it might be. I think in those cases, he'd have been, no, fair enough. Jesus, you're in your field of expertise, so we'll go along with you there. But this is our field. This is our day job. This is our front line. Just, just leave this to us. And I think this is particularly instructive because what this story shows us is that actually Jesus is equally able to help us in church and out of church. And we often in our heads make a kind of divorce, a separation between the um, quote unquote spiritual elements of our life, you know, Sundays, Wednesday nights, life groups, other things, other meeting, Christian meetings we might go to, and the rest of everything we do. But Jesus is just as powerful to help us on Monday as he is to help us on Sunday. You know, I would never dream, I'd be too scared to, to be honest, to get up here without praying first. I've been praying in my preparation. I've got friends who pray for me whenever I'm preaching. Uh, you know, I've prayed just before. I was on my knees just before we came up here. I'd never dream of doing it without prayer. And yet I will, if I'm honest, go into lectures and seminars and things like that sometimes without prayer. And I make this separation. So what I've tried to do is try and catch myself in these situations where I think, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing Jesus away in this area and I've got to bring him back. You know, when it's my workplace, I've got to, you know, you have a take your child to work day. It's like I've got to have a take Jesus to work day. I've got to bring Jesus back into these experiences. And I've got a little phrase that goes around in my head when I catch myself doing this. And it's this, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Okay? So I'll be thinking one way, thinking there's no way out of this situation. And I'll think, oh, this is crazy. I, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's powerful over everything and he can change. Let, let me give you an example. A few years ago, <clears throat> I was sat at the um, uh, uh, table in our, our living room and I was doing what I do, which for me most of the time is marking assignment papers. And I was marking these papers and I don't particularly enjoy it, which is a, um, an overstatement. And um, my wife Becky was in there as well and was playing with Jack. I think we hadn't had Isaac at this time. And I was just chatting away to them and saying, it's good actually, I'm, I'm nearly there. And when these ones are finished, then, you know, I, I've got just about a week's worth of teaching, then I've got three weeks for Easter. So I can have a bit of catching up with the family, I can catch up on some work I've missed, I can get a bit productive and get some preparation done and so on. And no sooner had I been expressing this thought 
that I had a revelation and my heart sank. And the revelation was this, hang on, there's another assignment coming in next week. Uh, and it's a huge cohort of students. And actually the marking just did a quick toss up in my head and it's literally gonna take all of the three weeks of Easter. So no sooner had I been looking forward to Easter than I'd lost the whole holiday. And I was moaning about this. And then I sort of caught myself mid-moan. Again, it was one of these moments. Oh, wait, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I said to Becky, no, no, let's not, let's not have me moan about this. Let's pray. So we did. Can't remember the prayer exactly, but it was something on the lines of, God, just please sort this situation out. You know, we need some time together. I need to focus on some other things. I need to get productive in other areas. Can you do something about this? Straight afterwards, <clears throat> I went out of the house into um, a storeroom slash office that we had on the outside of our house for a little while. It's now become a storeroom slash storeroom. Um, I mentioned that. It's a sore point for me. Anyway, um, I went out there. I fired up the computer, I checked my emails. And one of the first emails I'd, I'd got on the top of the list was my friend Linda, friend and colleague, who worked on the same module for me. And she basically said, um, look, guys, I'm, I'm not going to be around, it turns out, during the exam period when the exam marking comes in. So how about I do all of the assignment marking over Easter for everybody, um, and then when the exam comes in, you can just divvy up my lot between you. Okay? Now, not to get too deep into the technicalities of finance marking and stuff like that. Uh, but marking an exam, I find pretty straightforward. Marking an assignment, I pretty much loathe, I don't mind telling you. So, glory to God. <laughs> so I came out of there and I said to Becky, you'll never guess what happened. I told her, I said, you know what this means? She was like, yes, we must pray about everything. I said, yes, and good things come when I have an office. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But what have we done? We just brought Jesus back into our everyday lives. We've not had that. He can make a difference there. And that made a difference for us as a family and in other areas as well. Again, on our front line for us majorly is our parenting. When we have parenting issues, which for us has been a lack of sleep and things like potty training and potty training regression and things like that, we can sometimes think, well, God's not into this kind of stuff. You know, God's into the sort of less dirty and smelly areas of life. We can't bring him in for help here. In fact, sometimes you'll take a little boy during a nappy incident into the bathroom, open up the nappy, and the very next thought that comes into your head is, God has forsaken this place. Okay, but, <laughs> but it isn't true. God is just as interested in helping us in those elements of our lives as Sundays and Wednesday nights and so on. So we must call upon his help. We must do whatever we do with Jesus' help. And it isn't just things that will make a difference for us. I mean, those are kind of not not a bad thing at all, but selfish in one sense, things that will help us. I caught myself in this when praying for work, that it's often about how work will go for me. So recently, I've decided I've got to be praying for my department, that my department, the accounting and finance department at the university will do well. And just a few weeks ago, the vice chancellor started this initiative where he goes around all the departments. He gives a presentation, they give a presentation back, he gives some feedback, we have a chat and so on. He put out a tweet after he'd come to ours that he loved every minute of the two hours he'd spent with us, and what he didn't put on Twitter, which is what he told us, that he said he thought our department's presentation was the best he'd heard across the university. It's made a difference to everybody. Back when we got back to our office, out of the sort of ivory tower of where the vice chancellor is, you could just hear people laughing and joking. It just really lifts spirits. I went to tell my boss and said, this has really made a difference in this. I'd not actually made the connection that I'd been praying for the department and this happened until yesterday when I was thinking about all this stuff and then I said to Becky, hey, I've been praying about this. You remember the vice chancellor's meeting? This can make a difference. Let's seek Jesus' help in whatever it is that we do. But the second thing I mean when I'm talking about doing what we do with Jesus, I mean do what you do with Jesus' message. So not just do what we do with Jesus' help, but do what we do with Jesus' message. If we look at this passage, if I can put it like this, it's not really about fishing. It's not really about just saying to Simon Peter, if you do what Jesus says, you do things with Jesus, it'll bless your business. There's no question. I think Jesus is basically saying, that's okay. You can pray for productivity with your business. This is actually a living parable. This whole story is pointing to something else. It's not just about catching fish because Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid, I'll come back to why he says that in a moment. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is, look, I showed you that you can try and do it by yourself and get nothing. But when I come on board, I know where the fish are 
I can draw them into the place that I need them to be. I can tell you where to go. I just want you to supply the nets and the boats and so on and catch them for me. He's saying that is a picture of what we are going to do for people. I'm going to tell you where they are, where you want to go, and you are going to catch them. You're not going to use nets and boats. You are going to use the good news of Jesus Christ. You are going to go places and you are going to tell people that through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can be forgiven of their sins and have new life in me. <clears throat> Absolutely. And we've, we've got to get a hold of this. If we're going to be difference makers like Simon Peter, he got a hold of this. Simon Peter's first ever sermon. I'm not sure how many people got saved on my first sermon, but when Simon Peter did, uh, there were 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. That's pretty good going, right? He got it deep down that people need to hear the good news. Not just that Jesus comes along as a life coach to patch you up, give you some good advice, um, you know, help you along the way. No, no, he's a saviour and we need him. Simon Peter got this information deep down inside him. He internalised it. So he knew that wherever he went, he had to go. And whatever he did, he had to go with Jesus' message. Why was it that he got it so deep down? How did he recognise it? I think because of this experience. Because of meeting Jesus here, I think this is so significant and profound for Peter. And we can see that in his reaction. So a Bible teacher that I love called uh, R.C. Sproul, who sadly died uh, not too long back. And he really helped me with this passage. He talked about what Peter's reaction should have been when he saw the miraculous catch of fish. He should have gone up and got a, a contract out of his pocket and said, look, Jesus, here's my idea. Um, we'll start a fishing company. We'll call it the Jesus Peter Fishing Company. I'll supply the boats, the nets, etc. I'll tell you when to turn up. You do your little abracadabra over the waves. All the fishes will turn into the boat and then we'll split it 50-50. But he doesn't. What does he do? Well, at first glance, it looks strange, but his reaction is this. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. See, this is Peter recognizing he's not in the presence of some magician doing some trick. He is in the presence of God himself. On some level, he understands that this is a miracle, a holy miracle coming from a holy, righteous, pure God. And what happens when people come into contact with the true God, when they have an experience in the presence of God? Well, we see it right throughout Scripture. Peter isn't alone here. When Isaiah experiences the presence of God in the temple, Isaiah, probably an uh, Old Testament prophet, probably the most righteous man of his time, what does he do when he's in the presence of God? He says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. What does the disciple John do, who is the disciple Jesus loved and lay on Jesus' breast during the, the meal? What does he do when he sees the risen Jesus? And we can read about it in the book of Revelation. It says he falls on his face as though dead. What does Habakkuk do when he's arguing with God and then God finally answers him back in the presence of God and under the influence of this answer? He says, my body trembled, my lips quivered and decay crept into my bones. There is something about being in the presence of God that brings a holy fear and reverence over us. You know, when Jack was watching The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe yesterday and the witch had her day and the battle was coming and then all of a sudden Aslan turns up and he roars and everybody runs away. And he was just saying, why are everybody running away? I was saying, because Aslan's more powerful than everybody else. So why is he more powerful? I said, because he's the king and that's Jesus. Jesus is the king. He's more powerful than everything else. He's more holy. He doesn't come along just to patch us up. He doesn't come along just to make us a little bit better. He comes along because he needs to come along for us. If he didn't come along, we're lost. We can't save ourselves. We can't pull ourselves up by our moral bootstraps. We're too far gone for that. We're dead in our spirits and he needs to come and bring us life. And Peter understood this. Because he had this experience. He was in the presence of a holy God. And he said, get away from me for I'm a sinful man. But what happens when you have that bad news that you can't save yourself and you're unholy in the presence of a holy God? That's when the good news comes. And what does Jesus say to him? Don't be afraid. And he doesn't just invite him to be one of his men. He enlists him straight away to go and catch other people. And that's what he's done for us. Let's get a revelation. You know, I sometimes hear people who grew up Christians will say things like, oh, it's all right for other people, you know, if they were, um, I don't know, big drinkers or drug addicts or something like that. But I'd never really done anything wrong. 
And so, you know, for me, it was just about sort of meeting the Father or getting... But let's, let's not get away from the fact that actually all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We might be better than some of the people down the road and stuff like that. But if Jesus turned up right now in his glorified state, every single person in this room would be down on their face in front of a holy God. But what would he say to us? He'd say, don't be afraid. Come to me. This is the gospel in miniature. Peter got this. And he spent the rest of his life spreading the message of Jesus. And what does that mean for us? It means we've got to do the same. We've got to follow Jesus just as he did. doesn't mean we've got to go away on mission somewhere. It just means we've got to stay close to Jesus. And we've got to do what Peter tells us to do in one of his letters later on. Uh, Peter said this, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. In other words, you don't have to ram it down people's throats. You don't have to irritate everyone or be overbearing. But in our own way, through our own personality, every single one of us has to take in the necessity of the good news, to get it into our hearts. And when the time comes, let our preparation show with gentleness, with respect, yes, keeping a clear conscience, doing it with integrity. And whether that can be something as simple as grabbing a Christmas invitation and taking out, but we must do this. If we're to make a difference, we need to do what we do with Jesus' message. Thanks for listening. Can I ask you all to stand and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you saved us and you've given us great purpose. Lord, I thank you that you've given us good works to do. You've prepared those for us. Will you come, will you give us a revelation of what it means to do things for you and to do things with you. And I pray for every single person here that each one of us will be kingdom ambassadors wherever our mission field is, wherever we are. Will you come and help us with that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.